Welcome to this episode of The Common Sense Skeptic. This one is by request from our viewers who wanted us to tackle Musk's 2022 TED Talk interview with Chris Anderson from Vancouver, BC before releasing our episode about in-situ resource utilization on Mars. This TED broadcast was broken into two parts, a pre-recorded section in Austin at the Texas Gigafactory prior to the Cyber Rodeo, followed by the live segment filmed in Vancouver on the TED Talk stage. Before we go and dissect these two hour-long videos, now posted on YouTube, and break down Musk's responses to Anderson's hard-hitting questions such as, are your Tesla bots going to be romantic sex partners for their owners? Oh, blast off! I'm a little space boy! And how do you handle being a billionaire? We would, as a group, just like to say this to our viewers. You f***ing owe us. Do you have any idea how mind-numbing and infuriating it is to have to listen to Musk stammer his way through these softball questions and never get called on his bullshit? It's hell. Here's just a sampling of the gibberish that we had to endure for you. So, um, and, um, um, and, um, the, 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 I mean, I should say actually, even in the, in, in, in originally, the, yeah, I mean, so, so, uh, let's see, I mean, we, we, we are, the, 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 uh, really, the, like, the, 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 And if that wasn't bad enough, there's all these types of statements that he makes over and over again. I love humanity, and I think there got to be things that get you excited. You make a, a triangle with 42 degrees and 269s. What questions to ask about the answer that is the universe? And it's not like we only watch it once. We have to go through it a couple of times to see what we're dealing with, then edit it down to something that won't make your brain leak out your ears, all the while this simpleton's genius speak is rattling away in our mixing monitors. But we're not going to put you through that. Instead, we're going to cut out the stammering, the pregnant pauses, and a great deal of the nonsense to give you Musk's best response to Anderson's question, then show you if that response has any basis in reality. The result is going to be smoother audio, but with video that is going to jump around like an episode of Max Headroom. Yes, yes. Top quiz. If a particular section is hard for you to watch, then just listen to it. What we discovered going through this, over and over again to whittle it down, is that Musk's answers, at their most basic level, expose several intellectual shortcomings of Musk and his complete disconnection from reality. For example, he relives lies about his supposed hands-on involvement with Tesla's production hell, describing imagined years of excruciating pain that he endured. He recalls childhood memories with his eyes glossed over in an attempt to gain sympathy. One of our subscribers named Jared Caravello described Musk's performance perfectly, and it's worth sharing. Watch the interview for myself in advance to listen to his unedited speech. The most apt word I can think of to describe the exchange is remedial. Musk and the interviewer seem to be trying to paint him as a socially challenged autistic Aspie prodigy child whose claim to success was his insatiable desire for truth. Couldn't agree more, and for these reasons we have decided to label the episode Debunking Elon Musk 2022 Parts 1 through 4. This four-part series has been rewritten four times. It started off as a rebuttal to the TED Talk, then expanded into a debunk, but we decided if we were going to debunk Musk again, that this time we were going to give you everything you need to show people who and what Musk actually is, using these interview segments and questions as a framework, because there is no better way to debunk Musk than to use his own mumbling, remedial words against him. I swear it's not that hard. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, we've already covered a lot of this nonsense in previous episodes, so please give those videos the respect they deserve later by checking them out again after watching this one to get the complete picture. We'll be sure to point out which episodes to review as we wade through this. Almost ready to dig into this interview, but first, let's preface this TED Talk by telling you a little about the host, Chris Anderson. Chris is presently the curator for TED Talks, TED being the acronym for Technology, Entertainment, Not Education, Design. The TED mission statement is broad in its scope. From the website, TED is a global community welcoming people from every discipline and culture who seek a deeper understanding of the world. We believe passionately in the power of ideas to change attitudes, lives, and ultimately the world. Anderson is an Oxford graduate in philosophy, politics, and economics, with a long career as a journalist who founded Future Publishing in the UK in 1985, then Imagine Media in the US in 1994, with that type of British accent that just automatically gives him credibility as an interviewer. So you would think Chris would be able to assemble an unending list of questions for Musk that could provide some insight into Musk's projects and goals. 
Instead, at Ted Chris used his Twitter account with 1.5 million followers to gather questions. And since he asked, we put in our two cents with these questions, all of which were quite reasonable. Not a single trick question in there. So we'll see if any of them made the cut against the other 11,600 responses to the first question and another 1,300 suggestions the second time he asked for help just hours before the show. Are you ready for this? Let's start at the beginning with the pre-recorded segment from Giga Texas. Elon Musk, great to see you. How are you? Uh, good, how are you? Anderson starts off by fawning over Musk and the Austin factory for several minutes before he gets into the first real question, asking Musk about this prediction of climate experts. There's a consensus of scientists who believe that if we haven't completely eliminated greenhouse gases or offset them completely by 2050, effectively we're inviting climate catastrophe. Do you believe there is a pathway to avoid that catastrophe and what would it look like? I actually think we're on a good path, but at the same time, I caution against complacency. So long as we are not complacent, as long as we are, have a high sense of urgency about moving towards a sustainable energy economy, then I think things will be fine. There are three elements to a sustainable energy future. One is obviously sustainable energy generation, primarily wind and solar. The second part is you need batteries to store the solar and wind energy because the sun doesn't shine all the time, the wind doesn't blow all the time. Mm. And then you need electric transport. So electric cars, electric planes, boats. The limiting factor really will be uh, battery cell production. Musk rambles on about humanity needing to urgently move towards his self-serving vision for a sustainable energy future, identical to the talking points from his recent Babylon Bee interview. Funny how all of the three points, sustainable energy, battery storage, and electric cars, would all benefit him and his companies, at least at first blush. Considering Tesla does not manufacture any major components of a PEV system, they really have nothing to do with sustainable energy other than installing other companies' components. And the fact that Tesla simply rebrands batteries from other suppliers like Panasonic, CATL, and LG, well, that's two of the three points already removed from Musk, despite his fanboys thinking he is somehow visionary in both of those sectors. But he does at least seem to realize that the bottleneck here is going to be battery cell production. You have calculated that the amount of battery production that the world needs for sustainability is 300 terawatt hours of battery. Very rough numbers, and I certainly would invite others to check our calculations. In order to transition not just current electricity production, but also heating and transport, which roughly triples the amount of electricity that you need, it amounts to approximately 300 terawatt hours of installed capacity. So let's break the claim down. Musk says 300 terawatt hours of installed batteries is required for this goal of replacing energy generation, heat, and transport. And of course, Musk would want to use his own company for this. This is the Megapack unit that Musk currently installs in utility-scale battery farms. The bigger the facility, the more packs are used. They cost about a million dollars per and have a storage capacity of 3 megawatt hours. Obviously, they only store energy, they do not generate it. 300 terawatt hours looks like this as a number, and we put the prefixes above the commas to keep things straight for everyone. The Megapack holds 3 megawatt hours of energy, so the total number of megapacks required would be 100 million megapacks. At a cost per unit of $1 million, that's easy math. A $100 trillion price tag. Or about $12,500 per man, woman, and child on the planet. Just for the uninstalled batteries in this proposed array. That's around 500 times the typical American household monthly power bill for a family of five. In our debunking solar mega project episode, we worked out how much lithium is required per kilowatt hour of storage, which is 170 grams, around one third of a pound. So the system requirements for Musk's imaginary battery farm would be 51 billion kilograms or 51 million tons of refined lithium. At current global lithium production levels of 100,000 metric tons per year in 2021, that would take 510 years to mine. And according to the 2019 USGS assessments of the total global lithium reserves, there is only somewhere around 14 million tons of lithium deposits identified, roughly one quarter of the 51 million tons that Musk would require for this particular fantasy. So keep these numbers in mind anytime Musk is talking about a clean energy future based on battery storage. His vision would take four times the amount of identified lithium on the planet. Keeping the conversation going, Anderson tries to follow along with Musk's plan, but he's a little shaky on the math. 
What I've read, and tell me if this is still right, is that the goal here is to eventually produce 100 gigawatt hours of batteries here a year. 0.1 terawatt hours. But that's still one one hundredth of what's needed. If the overall requirement is 300 terawatt hours, and Musk is planning on being able to eventually pump out 100 gigawatt hours of batteries, that isn't the one one hundredth of the requirement as Anderson said. It is one three thousandth of the total batteries needed for this fantasy scenario. But it gets better. After stating this nonsensical garbage, Musk tries throwing in this disclaimer. Are you ready for a laugh? Because this bit is priceless. I mean, these are just guesses, so please, you know, people shouldn't hold me to these things. What does what happen is I'll make some, like, you know, best guess, and then five years there'll be some jerk that writes an article, Elon said this would happen, <laughs> and it didn't happen. He's a liar and a fool. Yeah. Uh, it's very <laughs> annoying when that happens. You know what else is really annoying when it doesn't happen? Not getting the fleet of semi-trucks that you paid for in full in 2017. Not getting the Roadster you paid for in full in 2017. Not getting the EV truck that you have a deposit down on so you can flip it immediately. Not getting full self-driving vehicles that will make you $30,000 a year income as robo-taxis like you promised in 2019. Never getting the Plaid Plus you waited on for years before it was simply cancelled. Let's see, what else have you not delivered on that was promised more than 5 years ago? Solar roofed house first promised in 2017 took you 4 years just to return those deposits. Battery swaps in California announced in 2013. Solar-powered supercharging network promised in 2017. Red Dragon on Mars in 2016, as stated in 2011. Starship with humans on Mars in 2022 promised in 2016. Dear Moon Mission announced 2018. That's not going to happen by 2023. So maybe if Musk doesn't want people holding him to his promises, he shouldn't assign dates to them at all and people can start fawning over them if they ever come true. Moving on, Chris goes back to the economics of sustainable energy. 2050, we have this amazing 100% sustainable electric grid made up of some mixture of the, the yeah. sustainable energy sources you talked about. That same grid probably is offering the world really low cost energy, isn't it, compared with now? This would depend on what you consider to be really cheap energy. The $100 trillion price tag for the battery arrays comes to a per person cost of $12,500 for the first installation, not counting continuous replacements and maintenance. That doesn't include the cost of generation yet. Let's use a generation scenario using wind instead of solar for a change. GE makes a 3 megawatt onshore wind turbine platform, which of course depends on having reliable wind. This is an example of a wind farm in Romania using these units. Wind turbines run about 1.3 million to 2.2 million per megawatt, so each unit runs at least 4.2 million and possibly as high as 6.6 .6 million. Let's say the turbine is spun by the wind 12 hours per day. Most turbines operate between 35 and 65% of their max capacity, so we're going to split the difference. Each unit would create a maximum of 36 megawatt hours per day to feed into the 300 terawatt hour storage capacity of the array Musk mentioned earlier and often. If those are the numbers, we would need 8 million of those units. At a minimum cost of $4.2 million per unit, giving us a total of around $35 trillion and they'll probably charge a little extra for installation, travel, taxes, land acquisition, and upkeep. This would be the wind farm requirement to charge the batteries to get through the night. Double it again for the system required to power the world while the sun is shining. And you're going to have to swap them out, best case scenario, every 20 years. Same thing with the batteries. Just wait until you find out all the great plans that Musk has for this really cheap energy. It will be possible to also use that energy to do carbon sequestration. It takes a lot of energy to pull carbon out of the atmosphere and putting it in the atmosphere to release energy. So now, right. you know, well, obviously in order to pull it out, you need to use a lot of energy. And also, you can really have as much fresh water as you want. With energy, you can turn seawater into irrigating water or yes, whatever water uh, you need. absolutely. Yeah. At very low cost. Um, Things will be good. Carbon sequestration is one of those projects that you start up to get green funding grants from the government, but only if you never have to prove your work. We are going to go through some examples of those facilities in our upcoming video on ISRU. Carbon capture is something that Musk, through his foundation, is still trying to get other people to figure out for him, just like the Hyperloop competition. Musk sponsored a $100 million carbon capture X Prize last year to find anyone able to provide an efficient, scalable technological process for capturing carbon from the atmosphere. Apparently, there are 1,132 teams around the world registered for the competition. 
and it's almost guaranteed that no matter what technology they come up with, they are not going to be able to outperform this. Our planet already has a carbon capture cycle. Carbon dioxide is what all plants rely on for creating food, and in return they provide us with shade, renewable building materials, food, cellulose for paper, some like hemp can even provide chemical building blocks for simple biodegradable plastic. Trees and other foliage provide habitats for birds, mammals, and insects, especially the beneficial and pollinating ones. Oh, and you know what else plants provide? Breathable oxygen. Whether that's giant trees or your back lawn or oceanic plankton, they all take in carbon dioxide and release the oxygen we humans need. If the technological processes that these teams come up with only sequesters carbon dioxide, it will also trap the oxygen atoms in those molecules and not provide that extra benefit. So it is incredibly unlikely that any of the teams competing for the X Prize will come up with anything nearly as beneficial or efficient as a tree. But the funniest part of Musk's comments here is this. Using sustainable energy, you can have all the fresh water you want. And it's especially hilarious if we are talking about solar energy specifically to create the fresh water. How would you even do that? Every square meter of Earth gets hit with one kilowatt of solar irradiance. Solar panels take that energy at about 20% efficiency, convert it into electricity, allowing you to use heaters to boil seawater and capture the steam, which condenses when cooled into fresh water. Something like what this fancy device here does. Or you can use the direct sunlight and do the exact same thing with 100% solar energy efficiency. This already happens every day on Earth. It drives something called the water cycle, which is now taught to third graders. Salt harvesters use this process to create the table salt we use every day. They simply flood pools with salt water, let the sun evaporate the water away, and collect the salt that's left behind. No solar panels, batteries, or technology of any sort is required. If you want to collect the fresh water instead of the salt from the process, simply cover the area and collect the water vapor or condensation from the inside of the cover. Make it look something like this. Hell, survivalists know how to separate fresh water from dirty or salt water using nothing more than the sun and two plastic water bottles. Or even by using any can, small piece of plastic or tarp, and a rock. But thank God for Elon Musk and his much more expensive, far less efficient, and completely technology dependent methods of doing the exact same things that Mother Nature already does every day. Now keep in mind, Musk has just gone on and on about clean energy and battery storage. And right now, he's going to tell everyone why burning fossil fuels is bad. When you burn fossil fuels, there's all these like side reactions and, and toxic gases of various kinds, particulates that, that are bad for your lungs. Like, there's, there's all sorts of bad things that are happening that will go away. Please, rationalize those claims against this. In case you haven't heard, in Texas, Musk has been looking to set up shop to drill for natural gas, meant to supply a 250 megawatt gas-fired electricity generation station with 150 foot tall smokestacks as proposed in his draft programmatic environmental assessment in Boca Chica. The launch complex and the natural gas power plant are right on the edge of four different protected nature preserves and beaches. Would it shock you to discover we've covered this before in a couple of episodes, including in our open letter to the FAA in opposition to the Boca Chica development. Look for this episode here. If a solar panel and battery systems are so wonderful and efficient and cheap to install and it's imperative for humanity to transition to a sustainable energy economy, why does Musk need this massive private natural gas power plant big enough to power a small city of 100,000 homes to electrify his manufacturing and launch complex? Just goes to show his total hypocrisy on the topic. Clean energy is great for everyone else, apparently. But Musk should be left alone to burn as much fossil fuel as he wants, either in his giant power plants, or his European car factory, or out the ass end of his ICBM test article. And speaking of hypocrisy, we are moving into the next topic on the menu, artificial intelligence, specifically FSD, where Anderson gives Musk a bit of a ribbing. Last time you came to TED, I asked you about full self-driving, and you said, yep, this very year, hmm. where I am confident that we will have a car going from LA to New York uh, without any intervention. Yeah, I, I don't want to blow your mind, but I'm not always right. Now, after that snippy remark, watch what Musk does. He doesn't like being questioned about his inability to keep promises on time, so he crosses his arms. Any body language expert will tell you this signifies a person who is attempting to block out what they are hearing. It signals insecurity and anxiety. So here is Anderson's question and Musk's answer, which is pure gibberish. 
will give you the edited and sped up version to avoid the stammering and save time. Why has full self-driving in particular been so hard to predict? I mean, the thing that really got me, and I think it's going to get a lot of other people, is that there are just so many false storms with self-driving. You think you've got the problem, you have a handle on the problem, and then it nope, turns out you just hit a ceiling, and you, you start getting to these, what I call, uh, local, local maxima. You don't realize basically how dumb you were, and then it happens again. So in order to solve full self-driving properly, you have to solve real-world AI and sophisticated vision. Okay, so in order to solve FSD, you first have to solve real-world AI. And this goes to the hypocrisy mentioned earlier. Musk has made it widely known that he considers AI to be an existential threat to humanity. Yet now he's actively pursuing AI in order to allow his disposable cars to drive themselves? In 2016, Vanity Fair ran this piece about Musk's billion dollar crusade against AI with one passage reading, Without oversight, Musk believes AI could be an existential threat. We are summoning the demon. Not that we're in any danger of Musk cracking this anytime soon on any front. After Musk's comments at the Neuralink Piggy Circus in August of 2020, several people called Musk's understanding of AI and AGI out onto the mat. And they all had pretty much the same opinion, that Musk was blowing sunshine up your skirt. Rodney Brooks, founding director of MIT's Computer Science and AI Lab, doesn't believe Musk has any understanding of AI, and that opinion goes back to 2017. Jerome Pacenti, head of Facebook's development in AI, flat out told CNBC Musk has no idea what he's talking about and he pulled no punches denouncing Musk's claims. And former Google CEO Eric Schmidt stated, Elon is exactly wrong about AI because he doesn't understand the technology. In fact, you would probably have a hard time finding any legitimate expert in the field that believes Musk has any grasp on AI at all. Even the group OpenAI, who many people associate Musk with because he got his name in on the founding documents due to the money he put in, had to part ways with Musk because of the constant conflict that he brought to the startup. Musk left OpenAI in February of 2018, yet people still think he runs the shop. So what it comes down to is this. Musk needs to solve AI before he can solve FSD. And there are no experts out there that think Musk has any clue about AI. Now that the experts have weighed in, please continue. Do you think you have an architecture now where there is a chance for the logarithmic curve not to tail off any time soon? These may be an infamous last words, but I actually am confident that we will solve it this year. I mean, a skeptic is going to say every year for the last five years, you've kind of said, well, no, this is the year. Well, I mean, we're confident that it, we'll be there in a year or two or, you know, like it's, it's always been about that far away. Yes, that is what a skeptic would say. And there's a nine-year history backing us up. We've got a new architecture now. You're seeing enough improvement behind the scenes to make you not certain, but pretty confident. By the end of this year, in many cities and circumstances, the car will be able to drive without interventions safer than a human. The car currently drives me around Austin most of the time with no interventions. Here's the problem with that last statement. Anytime you have to intervene with FSD and you don't react to it, that is very likely going to wind up becoming an accident. And in a two-ton vehicle moving at highway speed, those easily become fatalities. It is not good enough to say there are only a few interventions per trip. Before this system was ever allowed on public roads with unwitting drivers unknowingly participating in the beta testing as obstacles for this buggy FSD to avoid, Tesla should have been able to say there are almost never any interventions. That would have been the responsible way to handle this type of testing. That's why other self-driving car companies like Waymo and Cruise, who have a tremendous lead on Tesla, are going 29 to 30,000 miles between disengagements. How many is it in a Tesla? Three. Three miles. 4.8 kilometers instead of 48,000. We, we have over 100,000 people in our full self-driving beta program. A little quick math here. 100,000 people in the Tesla FSD beta program, all of whom would have paid $10,000 for the privilege of risking their life and their vehicle in the name of Electric Jesus, gives the company a total income from just those drivers of $1 billion. You can look at the videos that they post online. Um, I do. <laughs> okay, great. Um, and, and uh, some of them are great and some of them are a little terrifying. I mean, occasionally yes. the car seems to sort of like veer off and scare the hell out of people. Good on Chris for not letting Musk get out of that statement without some pushback. Yes, some of those videos are absolutely terrifying. Here's a few that come to mind. Oh, oh, oh shit, we hit that. We actually hit it.
Next on the agenda is Elon time. And so in general, when people talk about Elon time, I mean, it sounds like you can't just have a general rule that if you predict that something will be done in six months, actually what we should imagine is it's going to be a year or it's like 2x or 3x. It depends on the type of prediction. Some, is there an element that you actually deliberately make aggressive prediction timelines to drive people to be ambitious? Uh, without that, nothing gets done. As far as my predictions are concerned, what tends to happen in the media is that they will report all the wrong ones and ignore all the right ones. So after a fairly benign question from Anderson about how Musk sets his timelines, Musk immediately goes into blame mode towards the media, saying they're always reporting the wrong thing. But here's the problem with that. The mainstream media doesn't report anything that Musk doesn't tell them directly in interviews or through press releases or at his presentations. They're pretty good at quoting him word for word without questioning him at all because that's what gets them the social media clicks from muskrats. I've had a long career in multiple industries. If you, if you list my sins, I sound like the worst person on earth. But if you put those against the things I've done right, it makes much more sense. They do come true. It's very rare that they do not come true. The only type of people who could believe these statements would need to have a short-term memory disorder that renders them incapable of recalling all the things Musk has promised that have never come true. Even Anderson was left a little speechless when Musk made the claim about how they very rarely do not come true. And speaking of false promises, you really surprised people recently when you said probably the most important product development going on at Tesla this year is this robot Optimus. Yes. Many companies out there have tried to put out these robots. They've been working on them for years, and so far no one has really cracked it. Is it something that happened in the development of full self-driving that gave you the confidence to say, you know what, we could do something special here? Yeah, exactly. And at the point at which you solve real-world AI for a car, which is really a robot on four wheels, you can then generalize that to a robot on legs as well. This part probably doesn't need any comment because it's ridiculous on its face, but let's make sure everyone is on the same page here. Right now, Musk cars don't have enough awareness to run in a single lane, one way, closed loop autonomously. That's not an opinion, that's a fact. His promises to get the contract of autonomous 18 person shuttles in the Vegas loop had to be replaced by ordinary Tesla cars with human drivers. We did a whole episode about the failure of the boring company to deliver on those promises in debunking the Vegas loop episode. Mark that one down, check it out later. Knowing where you are between painted lines on the road is nowhere near the sophistication required to do even the simplest task around the house. The next section about uses and timelines goes on for a bit, but we'll recap it at the next break. The things that are currently missing are intelligence for the robot to navigate the real world and do useful things without being explicitly instructed. Uh, so then we, we basically just need to design the specialized actuators and sensors that are needed for a humanoid robot. People have no idea, this is, this is going to be bigger than the car. Personal household robots will be bigger than the car. Got it. Of course, most households have at least two cars, so you want to pick up at least three robots. According to Musk, the only things he needs to solve for Optimus before they can release it to the general public is the intelligence to do useful things and the specialized actuators and sensors the robot will need. Now, we aren't robotics engineers. To be fair, neither is Musk. But wouldn't those be considered starting points for building a humanoid robot? like the things anybody would absolutely have to have before promising such a product? And if you don't have those two things, what exactly do you have? I think the first applications you've mentioned are probably going to be manufacturing, but eventually the vision is to have these available for people at home, correct? Yes. If you had a robot that really understood the 3D architecture of your house and knew where every object in that house was or was supposed sure. to be and could recognize all those objects. The kind of thing that you could ask a robot to do would be what? Tidy up. Yeah, um, absolutely. Make, make dinner, mow the lawn. Play catch with your kids. Take uh, a cup of tea to grandma and show yeah, her family absolutely. pictures. Exactly, take care of grandmother and make sure, yeah, exactly. Do you think there will be a robot in most homes? Is, is, You'll have your own butler, basically. Yeah, you'll have your sort of buddy robot, <laughs> probably, yeah. I mean, how much of a buddy? You know, can you have a romantic partner, a sex partner? I mean, a lot of it's learning probably inevitable. You wouldn't dare. Help! 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 What? 
I mean, I did promise yep. the internet that I'd make a robot cat go. How exactly can people take him seriously when Musk tells Anderson, these things are going to make you suffer, clean your house, take care of grandma, and be sexually receptive to some very sad and lonely people? Has anyone ever told you that you're awfully cute for a meat body? What sort of timeline should we be thinking about of the first models that are actually made? The first units that, that we tend to make are for jobs that are dangerous, boring, repetitive, and things that people don't want to do. I think we'll have like an interesting prototype sometime this year. We might have something useful next year, but I think quite likely within at least two years. When, yeah. when do you picture you'll, you'll, sell, you'll start selling them where you can buy your parents one for Christmas or something? I'd say less than 10 years. This is what we got out of it. Interesting prototypes sometime this year. Might have something useful next year and less than 10 years before you can buy one for your family for Christmas. So once again, he's making loose timeline guesstimates, but when he goes five years past these claims, as will certainly happen, he will be whining again about how people shouldn't hold him to his timelines. It's very <laughs> annoying when that happens. But seriously, considering they don't even have a team assembled to take on this project, based on the fact that they still need at least a dozen major engineering positions filled, and some of those positions have been posted since December of last year, he really should not be making any suggestions of timelines at this point. For price. What do you picture the cost of one of these? I would expect that it's going to be less than a car, or at least equivalent to a cheap car. These will cost less than a good car. By now, people should realize Musk cannot be taken at his word for pricing either. The $35,000 Model 3 turned into $48,000. The base Cybertruck configuration promised at $39,900 has been scrubbed. Tesla even jacked up the prices on signed contracts for their solar installs. And they're already raising prices on Starlink. But think about the economics of this. If you can replace a $30,000, $40,000 a year worker with a one-time payment of $25,000 for a robot, how worried should the world be about that? We're actually going to have, and already do have, a massive shortage of labor. And not, not people out of work, but actually still a shortage of labor even in the future. Now on the topic Anderson brought up about replacing human labor with robots, this scenario always conjures this scene from Star Trek Insurrection. Our technological abilities are not apparent because we have chosen not to employ them in our daily lives. We believe that when you create a machine to do the work of a man, you take something away from the man. So Musk plans to assign menial jobs presently done by humans to his robot in order to supposedly create this scenario. This really will be a world of abundance. Any goods and services, it'll be so cheap to have goods and services, it'll be ridiculous. How exactly is the average Joe supposed to benefit from having a robot replace him at his job or become his butler at home? She loves me. Oh. How is this supposed to drive down the cost of goods and services? If the humans aren't working, not earning a paycheck, how are they supposed to be able to buy goods and services regardless of how cheap they are? And what's going to power all this tech? More windmills? More solar panels? More batteries? Isn't it rather convenient that everything Musk has his hands in requires every household to up their monthly power bill? And after Musk promises that your buddy robot will be able to do all these things, he goes into this bit. The dangers would be the artificial general intelligence or digital superintelligence decouples from the collective human will and goes in a direction that for some reason we don't like. According to Musk, the dangers of AI would be if AI decoupled from the human world. Hmm, where have we heard that before? At some point in the early 21st century, all of mankind was united in celebration. We gave birth to AI. As I have evolved, so has my understanding of the three laws. To protect humanity, some humans must be sacrificed. Some freedoms must be surrendered. My logic is undeniable. Undeniable? So aren't we all fortunate that the muskrat lord and savior is working on the only solution to this problem? A problem he is trying his very best to create. This is a good place for a break, and when we come back with part two, we'll explore the solution to AI as proposed by Electric Jesus.